So on our second day of the class, I've got some new handouts for you, as well as the old ones. So what you want to do is, your computer should be on. At the top left corner, double click on computer. Open our computer window up here, top left. Then you will see a network location. Classroom data, drive Z is zebra. Double click that one. Classroom data Z. And then this is alphabetical. You need to scroll down to Campus SEO Monday. I teach more than one class, so make sure you're in the right class. Campus SEO Monday. Double click that. And then I've got some files here. Don't double click them. But I've got some files here for you from last week. I wrote some notes. I drew this picture of the long tail keyword strategy, strategy concept. There's the syllabus. And I gave instruction number one last time. This week I've got two and three. So what you should do is, you should copy the whole folder. You can just drag that whole folder, if you back up SEO Monday, drag it to your desktop or flash drive. You want to drag the whole folder of Campus SEO Monday to your desktop. And you can close the network so that other people can access it. You don't want to open files in the network folder. It slows it down and causes problems. So once you've copied that folder, close the network folder, and now you've got a copy of your, your files. And the printer's off at the moment, so if you would like to print that, you'll have to wait for the break. But inside the SEO folder there, there's the syllabus. If you're new today, make sure you look at it. My email's in there. Last week we talked about the long tail keyword strategy, which was developing our keywords. <laughs> we need to develop a keyword strategy to be found. So in short, these are, the, these are the words and phrases that people are going to search for when they try to find something. If you've developed a strategy where you've gathered, as my handout said, about five to ten of them, you have these various keywords to get found by. Today we'll look at Webmaster Tools and Backlinks. So go ahead and view item number two, Campus SEO 2, Webmaster Tools. During the next break, I'll turn the printer on if you'd like to print. But here on the Webmaster Tools, this is just my all-encompassing term for Google, uh, Google Analytics, Google Search Console, and Bing Webmaster Tools. Because, as I said last week, we are going to optimize our site so that it's great for Bing and for Google. Because Google has about 62% market share, we need to pay attention to it. And because Bing has about 20% market share and increasing, we need to pay attention. So we're, we'll, be, we'll be working with Google and Bing. Yahoo uh, has really gone by the wayside in since the glory days of the 90s and that Yahoo had about you know like 95 percent market share of search it's gone all the way down to around like five percent so it's lost a lot of value but at least the good thing is that for people that still use Yahoo when they search Yahoo has contracts with Google and Bing so that when you search Yahoo you're still gonna get results coming from Google and Bing so if we optimize ourselves to get found by Google and Bing people on Yahoo will find us. And then besides that, there's a bunch of other search engines that are not quite relevant, unfortunately. So I'm not going to really talk about them. But it's about Bing and Google. So here I've got a section on Google Webmaster Tools, a section on Bing Webmaster Tools, and then on page two, some concepts here. Let's jump to page two. And we'll talk about page two first. And I'll write some notes here. I'll make my notes available to you in the network folder, but you should also take notes. So I've got here conversion goals. You must decide the goals of your company early on. In my fictional business, Victor's Bakery, <coughs> I want people to buy my cupcakes. That's a conversion goal. In order to get to that goal, I have many conversions before that point. So an industry buzzword is conversions. You hear that in web 
in SEO and marketing in general, conversions. One other term for it is simply goals. Specifically, when a goal is reached. Conversions. When a goal is reached. It comes from conversions because let's say I'm trying to sell cupcakes. There are people that have not bought my cupcake, and there are people that have bought my cupcake. The ones that have not bought my cupcake are unconverted. The ones that have bought my cupcake are converted. So conversions are whenever a goal is reached, and that's any goal. As I said, I'm a fictional company selling cupcakes. I want to sell cupcakes. Those are my conversion goals. But if I'm, let's say, a realtor, a conversion goal is to sell a house. Or to get people to call me back. I may meet people, give them my card, and that's where it ends. But I might meet people, I give them my card, and I get a call. That's on the way to selling a house. But simply that they called me, that is a conversion goal as well. They were not converted, they never called me, they were converted, they did call me. Then I get the ball rolling and proceed. So actually, there's conversions, but before that, there are impressions. When a person is made aware of you, of you, of your presence, your online presence, your realty business, my nonprofit organization, whatever it is I'm trying to do online. So let's say I'm a nonprofit organization. The goal of that is to raise awareness to help the animals. Well, that's nice, but I need money. I need funding to help the animals. So when people know about my nonprofit organization, that's an impression. They find out about me. My next conversion goal is for them perhaps to donate to me. So impressions are when someone becomes aware of you and in and in in search engine in in the SERP. Do you remember that keyword SERP search engine results page? On the Google search page result, on the Bing search result page, on the Yahoo result page, the SERP. On the SERP, this is simply my site shows up on SERP, the search engine results page. Someone searches gluten-free cupcakes for sale in San Diego. And my bakery appears on the SERP. That was an impression. Then someone clicks on my site on the SERP. That's the conversion. They saw my page, they actually clicked on it, that's a conversion. So those are two big keywords, buzzwords, that you hear a lot in this business. Impressions and conversions. And there's another one that combines the two. CTR. Click through rate. And that's taking uh, conversions divided by impressions. As an example, let's say my website showed up or was visible or was viewed on on the SERP. 64 times and two people clicked 2 divided by 64 which is 3 percent question search engine results page so in my case here uh, how many did I say four clicks out of 64 impressions 4 divided by 64, 0.6 percent, 6 and a quarter percent. My CTR is 6.25 percent. There is no right or wrong number for the CTR. Actually, the right number is 100 percent, but you'll never get there. 50 percent is also really good. You're going to have a hard time getting there. 10 percent is really good. You have a hard time getting there, too. It really depends on your business, your competition, and how well you're doing SEO. And so 1% CTR is much more common and attainable 
So 1%, 2%, 3%, maybe 5%. So your CTR is usually pretty low because also in the real world it's low. Your return on investment. I go to a network event, I talk to 20 people, one of them calls me back. What's my CTR there? Any math majors? 1 divided by 20, 5%. So, again, very low, and that's common. The higher you get it, the better. But you're going to invest a lot of time and effort to get higher CTR. But that's just an industry buzzword that you also here should be aware of. Click-through rate. What I've got on my handout here is that I want to sell cupcakes. That's my ultimate conversion goal. In order to get to that goal, I may have many conversion goals before that point. So I list a bunch of them here. I'm not saying you need to do all of these, but think about if you're able to do these, because that will be more impressions, and more impressions lead to more conversions. So I've got get followers on Twitter. That's an idea. The reason you want to get followers on Twitter more Twitter followers equals uh, possibly more conversions. What that means is I've got 50 followers on Twitter. I tweet something. Sale this Sunday. Use this coupon. Out of those 50 that I have, not all 50 are going to notice it or click the link to go to your website or click the link to go to your website and click buy. Again, you're going to have a low CTR. But the more followers that I have, I can possibly get more conversions. So you might target the 1%, meaning What's 1% of 50 followers? What's 100% of 50 followers? What's 1% of 1,000 <coughs> followers? Because the 1% are going to be the ones that really follow through. Those that really will follow through. That will buy your product, that will read your newsletter, that will donate to you, that will um, comment on your, on your articles. 1% of people, realistically, are actually going to follow through because it's, it's very easy to follow someone on Twitter. It's very easy to give a like on Facebook. It's much harder to actually follow through and do something about it. People used to think, well, I've got 10,000 followers on Twitter. If I can only get them to donate $1,000 I mean, $1 a month, I'd have $10,000 income monthly. Even getting $1 donations from your 10,000 followers is a challenge. So out of that 1% of 10,000, how much is that, 100? $100 a month from donations of $1 from your followers on Twitter. So think about this in terms of 1%. The more followers you get on Twitter, the more that 1% increases. I've got get social interactions like likes, shares, and comments on Facebook. So Facebook is the largest social network. It has about 1.5 billion users. Not million, billion. Lots and lots and lots of people use Facebook. The population of the world is about 6 billion. And you've got 1.5 billion people on, on Facebook. That is a really big amount of people on Facebook. There's challenges to being effective on Facebook. Take the social media class and we talk about all of that. But Facebook is the largest social network, and what I want, as I said there, I want these social interactions, like shares and comments. That's basically, um, I write something on Facebook, I publish something on Facebook, I've got, let's say, 10 likes. Uh, you can basically think of likes as followers to some degree. So if I had uh, 10 likes, on Facebook and 
So that means possibly 10 people saw my latest post. One of those 10 people themselves had a thousand followers. And what they did was shared my item that they read and liked to their 1,000. That then helps me reach 1,010 reach on Facebook. So I want to get people to see my stuff on Facebook, share my stuff on Facebook, comment on it, like it, because Facebook, have you noticed that when you're doing something on Facebook and you see something here, Janet liked this, Janet commented on that. You are getting updates from the friends and family that you're connected to about what they're doing on Facebook, and that'll, that could help you because your post about sign up now to get 10% off could have been liked by someone that had a thousand uh, friends on Facebook and now you reached even more. So I want to get more people to share my stuff on Facebook. It's the largest network. I want to get uh, site visits via Google Plus. So Google Plus is Google's social network. There was Facebook <coughs> since 2004. There's Twitter since 2006. There's Google Plus since about, I think, 2012, maybe 2011. And people spend a lot of time doing Google search. But as I've said before, and I'll say again, Google's market share is decreasing. Bing's is increasing, and also Facebook's reach is increasing, and on all the other networks, Google's reach is decreasing, Google search. So Google said then, okay, people are using Facebook a lot. People are spending all day on Facebook rather than Google. What can we do to bring people more traffic back to Google? We'll create our own social network that is like Facebook, that allows you to connect with friends and family, with companies, share pictures, share videos, funny cat pictures, all of that stuff, like Facebook. So you may have never used Google+. You may not know anyone that's used Google+. But Google+, also has around 300 million users globally. Uh, Twitter's got about, I believe, 320 million at the moment, globally. So Google, Google Plus, hundreds of millions of people using it. You may have never used it, you may have never heard of it, you may not know anyone, but hundreds of millions of people use it. And honestly, personally, and I can show other st statistics, I personally see when I share something from one of my clients on all the big ones, Google Plus, Facebook, and Twitter, the one that gets the most activity and results is Google Plus. I go on Google Plus, I target my content or I target the client's content and I see more results on Google Plus. Even though there's more followers on Facebook and more people on Twitter, I get I, I see that for the clients. It won't work for everyone, but I anecdotally can tell you that and I can show you statistics as well. So Google Plus is another way to get attention because I'm trying to get more website vi visits to Google Plus. Google Plus is so integrated with Gmail, Google Search, Google Maps, all of the Google products. I bet if you're driving around in the Google car, it's got a Google Plus button inside of it too. And so I want to be on the network that is, the social network that is hand in hand with the largest search engine because it can give you more traffic. So um, what you all, another reason to use Google Plus is uh, Google Plus um, for business is known as Google Places. Do you ever do a search uh, on Google and then of a local business, you're looking for taco shops, and then a bunch of results appear. But some of the results are on a map. And it has driving directions and star ratings. And the other ones don't. The other ones just look, just look like plain links. The Google Plus pages are the ones that are those special ones, the ones that have the map and the ratings 
and, and look nicer and stand out and make me want to click on them more than the plain links. So I can create a Google Places, which is Google Plus, account for business and tap into that. And it's free, of course. So why would you not do it? Another conversion that I might have is uh, get more hits on my home page to my website. The importance of getting more traffic to your website, because sometimes people come in and ask me, they come into this class and ask me, do I still need a website if I'm a superstar on Facebook, if I have a lot of followers on Pinterest, uh, do I still need a website, a home page? And usually the answer is yes, because your home page is where users so that's clients, potential clients, whatever, where users complete their ultimate goal, ultimate conversion. My company, fictional company of a bakery, my ultimate conversion is to sell baked goods, cupcakes, pies, cakes, whatever. That's my ultimate conversion. I'm in this business to sell cupcakes, baked goods to make money off of that. I can't do that via a tweet. I can't do that via a Google Plus post. I can't do that via a Facebook post. All of these social networks are great for getting the word out, but you cannot do any sales at the moment through the social networks. You still have to guide them back to your homepage, or your Etsy, or your eBay, or wherever the actual infrastructure to buy is. So I still want to get traffic back to my home page where I have the full control of putting products, or putting that subscribe button, or putting that donate button, or putting my blogs, because I might write a 700 word blog post, but no one's going to read it in the tweet. It doesn't even fit. No one's going to read it on Facebook because they're just going to see a lot of black and white text. Over on my blog, I can make a nicely formatted 700 word blog post with pictures and graphs and design that will make people read it, want to read it. I can put 700 words on Facebook. It lets you. But it's just a big wall of text. People don't like that. People want to read it, have it in chunks, bullet points. I can't do bullet points on Facebook. Graphs divided this chapter, that chapter, design. I can't do that on Facebook. I still want traffic back to my website. Because at the moment, the little guys, all of us, the little people cannot sell directly via social media. <coughs> the little people, the big people can. If you follow Amazon on Twitter and they tweet, about a product. All you have to do is click reply with buy and you bought it. Because your credit card is attached to your Twitter account and your Amazon account and when Amazon tweets <coughs> and you like that item just click reply tweet and you bought it. That's it. Pinterest, if you're Martha Stewart, if you're Macy's, if you're the big companies, you can buy directly from a Pinterest pin. And Facebook eventually will do that to some degree too. <coughs> so us little people, we can't do that yet. The big people can. That's why you still need traffic back to your website, where you have the shopping cart, where you have the buy now, the donate, all of that. Whenever any of these global events happen and you can, uh, you can donate five dollars via text message, you're not the Red Cross, you're not FEMA, you're not the big companies yet, you are the little companies, and therefore you still need traffic back to your website. get more shares on my blog post from my site. So notice that is presupposing blog posts. So blogging is highly important for modern SEO. What's a blog? Basically articles published on a regular basis. If you think about the websites you visit on a regular basis, you come back because there's something new, and usually that's a blog. I might be into cooking, so I follow various cooking blogs, and I come back every once in a while uh, when there's a new article. 
One of my hobbies is reading and collecting comic books. I like to visit a website about the latest about comic books. I come back and check out the blog posts. So blogging then is a way for you to create content so that when someone searches uh, a particular concept, one of the clients that we have is a Mexican food restaurant. One of the delicacies that they serve, traditional Mexican delicacy, are chapulines. Who knows what chapulines are? There is an article on the website called, What are Chapulines? So if someone does a Google search, a Bing search, a Yahoo search, and they search, What are Chapulines? That website, that client could show up on the search results because there is that keyword, long tail keyword, that was searched for, a blog post about it. Basically, they are a traditional uh, Mexican food of fried grasshoppers. So a little bowl of grasshoppers, some, some chile, some lime, tortillas, there's a meal right there. Add some avocados, that's a traditional Mexican delicacy. And there's a blog post about that. That was published, there's another one coming up about some of the other food served, not as exotic, but other food that the restaurant serves. And so if you take the blogging class, we take time where we brainstorm for everyone ideas of what to blog about. What do people want to know about your business? Because those are the questions that people are going to search for on Google, on Bing. And blogging lets you create those articles with those questions, with those keywords to help you get found. The question then is, okay, how long should the blog posts be? How often? As a beginner, a good goal. 100 words per month. That's a beginner. Think about the websites you visit on a regular basis. There's something new every day. And it's maybe, you know, 100 words, 200 words, 70 words. But every day, there's something new on some of the most trafficked sites out there that have a blog. Better, sometimes you see articles that say, well, if you're going to be blogging, you better be, write, be writing at least 300 words. Yes, the more you write, the more content is out there. But also, 300 words is, as a beginner, that's a lot of a challenge to do on a regular basis. Uh, you know, the best advice is to be writing, you know, 300 words a day. It's a lot of content. You need a stable of authors. For a beginner, 100 words a month is attainable. And I want to create content because I want shares. Again, this whole thing about sharing, that's the whole secret, the whole point of social media, to build an audience. I have 10 followers on Twitter, but two of those followers have, one of them has 1,000 followers, and one of them has 7,000 followers. Maybe the follower of mine that has 7,000 decided that my blog post was amazing and shared it. I now suddenly reached 7,020 people. Those 7,000 that they had plus the 20 I had. So good articles entice people to share your content, spread your message, be cheerleaders for you, be marketers for you. I'm going to do it, of course, but I would like my followers to also help me out to share stuff. Get subscribers to my coupon newsletter. Again, not all of these items you need to do. The more you do them, the more avenues you have to reach people. Newsletters. Uh, you've probably subscribed to some email lists before. Uh, I know I'm subscribed to the Fry's Electronics newsletter, and I love it and I hate it because every time I get it, I want to buy so much stuff at Fry's, and I have to be careful. But I see that when I get the newsletter from Fry's, it says, here's your exclusive code. And it's giving me 20% off everything that week. I don't get that 20% unless I'm subscribed to the newsletter. If I go buy that item and my friend does, I get the 20% and she doesn't because I have the coupon in my newsletter. And so entice people to subscribe. to your newsletter, your email newsletter. Perhaps with exclusive content, coupons, 
you know, whatever. Content's a big word. So uh, exclusive when I follow, when I subscribe to f Fries on an email, through their email list, I'm getting a coupon only for me. I might have, you might already have a website and there's a button that says subscribe. And if it simply says subscribe, why? What are you, what are you gonna do to convince people to subscribe to you? You've got the button and you're gonna say subscribe for the latest coupons. Subscribe for exclusive content. Follow us to keep up to date with your finances. Subscribe. Some sort of um, enticement to get that subscriber because when someone subscribes they've also they've also given consent to be marketed to they've said yes send me stuff right to my inbox hopefully you're selling s sending relevant things non spammy things you're enticing people to sign up that way that when you send them something directly to email and the headline says one day only sale it's gonna entice a lot of people the psychology of marketing is very powerful decades of research so that with the right marketing people will do anything good and bad and for you you're gonna use it for good and you're gonna use it to get the word out of your products your brand sell coupons whatever and that's a big topic. There's no class, to my knowledge, at this college that talks about email marketing. I certainly don't teach it. It's a huge topic. Uh, there's only so much that I know and can teach about. But what I would say is if you want to look into MailChimp and or Constant Contact, those are the two big names. There's other ones, of course, but those are the two big names when it comes to email marketing. MailChimp gives you a free account. I'm not sure if Constant Contact does. Usually I use the paid one. MailChimp also has a paid one. With MailChimp, I believe it can manage 2,000 contacts, up to 2,000. And when you go past 2,000, you need to upgrade and pay. But basically, both of these sites are to keep track of your email database and creating cool newsletters with nice templates and designs and such and tracking statistics. And this is a huge thing. You could teach a four-week class on email marketing. But uh, to my knowledge, there's no class at this college that does that. Um, but we can go to the world's best teacher, who is YouTube. Go to YouTube, search up any topic. You're going to find people giving you great lectures on everything. S search how to do email marketing. Search what's the best email marketing. Search how to use constant contact. Someone has made a lecture about it. Someone's put it up online. For free on YouTube. Always check the reviews on the videos. Just because there's a video out there doesn't mean it's the best. Check check their thumbs up, thumbs down. If there's a video that's got lots and lots of thumbs down, perhaps it's not the best one to listen to. But if there's a video that's got a lot of thumbs up and a lot of views, that's good. Just because a video has a lot of views doesn't mean it's good. So make sure you, you look at the thumbs up, thumbs down, and the comments. Although be careful about comments because those can quickly devolve into shouting matches. But YouTube is a great way to learn about everything. Next we've got get virtual clients or followers to come to my physical location. You can do geo-targeting um, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Google+, on most of the big networks meaning that I can see people at locations. I can search on Twitter for hashtags and a location. I was just with a, with, with a, with a client uh, slash friend the other day and uh, he's got a, a comic shop and he wants to of course get people to come to his shop in Mission Valley. It doesn't behoove him, it doesn't benefit him to be searching on Twitter Spider-Man and getting results all over the US if he's trying to sell comics about Spider-Man in Mission Valley. So on Twitter you can search that keyword and the location San Diego plus a radius to find out who's tweeting about that topic in this location. On Facebook same thing. 
I can post and target two people at a location in Google Plus. I can search locations. And the point of that is I want my, my virtual followers. I might have 500 Twitter followers. 20 of them are in San Diego. 20 of them could come to my store. I want to get them to come to my store, especially if my product is something that I sell in person. I'm a restaurant. I'm not going to ship you that lasagna to New York. You come to the restaurant on Main Street, and there's your food. So I want to get virtual clients to come to the, to the location, and you can do geo-targeting. Turn your local social followers into real visitors. In the social media class we talk about that, how to do it, but the concept is you want to, you want to target local people if you've got a local business. If I'm shipping my books throughout the whole US, that's less of a concern. But I can still po target population centers, so maybe my book might be very popular in Seattle or New York or Austin, and I can target my tweets and such, my Google Plus posts and such, to people in locations so that those so that more, like I'm saying here, 1%, so that more people can actually follow through. And then this final point, get clients to buy my cupcakes. You should see that it's a long, involved process to get from point A, a potential client follows you on Twitter, on Twitter, to Z, the follower visits the store and buys a product. That's why search engine optimization goes hand in hand with search engine marketing. And so a lot of the things that I mentioned right here are SEM, search engine marketing. Twitter is SEM, Facebook, Google+, your homepage that's SEO, blogging is SEO, that newsletter is SEO, SEM, geotargeting is SEM. So SEM, search engine marketing, what are you doing outside of your website? SEO, search engine optimization, what are you doing on your website? Because then that's your, yeah, that's your ultimate conversion. Actually selling that product, in my case, you're not going to get sales right away. It's very hard. People have a lot of things to do all day, and it's very easy to click on that follow button on Twitter. It's very easy to click that like button and whatever, but it's much harder for them to move that mouse one inch over to click buy because of human nature, because of our time constraints, monetary constraints, etc. A final point here is that an emerging keyword or buzzword for this is content marketing that encompasses SEO and SEM because if I'm only working on a website, that's not enough. I need to do out stuff outside the website. I need to create content on my website, publish it on my Facebook. Content marketing. And there's an article there on Forbes that you can go read, and it's got ideas and such concepts. But that's a word you might be hearing more nowadays. Content marketing. Any questions on this uh, page here? Many of the concepts that I mention here are also explored deeper in other classes, especially social media and the blogging class. So what we're going to do is, let's say we engage in a variety of these concepts. Remember last week I gave you a link over to more ideas of marketing. Um, but let's say we engage in a variety of these, like tweeting and Facebooking and so forth. How do we know if it's working? One way to know is that the ultimate goal is accomplished, which is that I look at my cash register at the end of the month, and I see that I sold more cupcakes. I see that I tweeted about that cupcake, and that cupcake sold more, as well as related cupcakes. That's one way to check those results. But as I, as I said again, this final conversion here is one of the hardest ones to reach. We have to check out, are the other things working along the way? And so that backs us up to the first part of this document. 
We need to set up the webmaster tools for Bing and for Google. We need to set up our statistics tracking system. This, um, these sites will track what were the keywords that people used to find your site. What were the most popular visited pages on your site? <coughs> How long did people hang around on your site? What was their web browser? Did they came from that tweet and clicked on this page and then that page. All of that data, the search engines know. And on the one hand, that's pretty scary about how much information of ours is up online and on the search engines. But on the other hand, as a marketer, as a website, uh, as someone that's got a website that I'm trying to do something online, that's great because I want to know that someone came from Los Angeles and stayed five minutes on my site and they looked on this page and that page. It's showing me the effectiveness of that page or the, or the reach that I'm getting that I didn't think people in LA cared about what I was writing about on my blog. Having that knowledge gives me power. You've heard that expression, knowledge is power. So having all of this knowledge about what's happening traffic-wise on my site gives me the power to act upon that. And that's all of these concepts of Google Webmaster Tools, Google Analytics, Bing Webmaster. That can be taught, you know, four weeks straight. But uh, from what we'll be talking about it right now, we'll get as much of it as we can. What I want to do first, because this is, this is shifting gears, this is the end result. This is actually setting things up. We're going to uh, take our first break because you should gather, like I asked you last week, you should gather your login information. If you're going to set this up like I'm going to show, you should have your login information to your website. And that's either the, the login information to edit the, the website or to log into your provider. Let's say you've got Bluehost. So either you log in to edit the website or to log into Bluehost. Either should work. I'm going to take our first break. When we come back, we'll do this part of the sheet and and we'll go on. We'll be back at 1.35.